Welcome back to our Bay Area Housing Market Update, part two for this month. And we are excited because I finally get to answer some of the most common questions that you guys are asking with two professionals from the mortgage industry. Jeff Burns and Wes Isley, they are the industry leaders with the California Mortgage Bankers Association. So I thought, who will be better to ask them to get to understand the number of forbearance and foreclosure activities that might be affecting our housing market update. And not only that, they will be answering questions regarding the residential market and also multifamily market because both of them can be very, very different. So I am very excited to share the following videos with you. It is quite long because there are a lot of questions that we want to answer. So I hope you guys will enjoy and provide your feedback down below. See you soon. I want to introduce our speakers. Um, so the first one is Wes Isley. And Wes Isley, actually, he is a senior managing director from Carrington Holding Company. And he is currently responsible for all external transactions and manages key business relationships and strategic alliances for the Carrington family of companies. He's also a board member of the California Mortgage Bankers, the MBA Independent Mortgage Bankers, and the acting chairman of the National Association of Mortgage Servicers. Hi, Wes. Let me unmute everything. Hi, everybody. Go ahead. Go ahead be here. Welcome, and thank you so much for being here. <laughs> All right, so let me in, go ahead and introduce Jeff Burns as well. He is our um, another speaker, but he will be focused and focusing on more on multifamily side, and he specializes in multifamily financing for Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and other capital sources. And um, Mr. Burns joins Walker and Dunlop in February 2009. And throughout Mr. Burns' career, he has completed over $13 billion in commercial real estate transactions. And Mr. Burns currently serves on the board of directors of the California Mortgage Bankers Association and was the president of commercial of the California Mortgage Bankers Association. He had also served on the Freddie Mac Advisory Council. He is a member of the Urban Land Institute and the Bay Area Mortgage Association. Mr. Burns earned a bachelor degree in political science from Oregon State University and a master of uh, business administration from the University of San Francisco. And welcome, Jeff. Thank you, Helen. Good to be here with everybody today. Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited today because both of you have a lot of deep knowledge, obviously, in the mortgage loan side. And I, as I've told both of you before, I do the mortgage loans updates every single month. But now, as I'm going into my segment talking about mortgage loans, I would love for you to give me some feedback about the research I've done. Are you guys ready? We're ready. <laughs> sure. All right. Maybe, right. maybe I'll I'll jump in and see what what Jeff thinks. And I'm like, and looking at um, on on the resi side, especially like rates, because two things are driving this this whole the, these home sales is it's it's rates, the low rate <laughs> inventory. I mean, like the ten year right now is a one point one four up from August. Lenders out there aren't lowering the rates. They they have I mean fat spreads because they can't keep up with the volume they have. So if you lowered your rates even more there'd be even more backlog and, and underwriting. So I, you know, there's, there, there's room in there as, as the tenure probably increases. Um, you know, I think the, the big concern for everybody, uh, there's a, a blog out there from um, Les Parker, it's called the Spotlight blog, which is gets into hedging and everything else, but it has some great overviews. And the big concern there is that the economy is popping back up. Um, this whole inflation thing, like when, like when you're recording the inflation figures, it came out today at 1.2 year after year with a slight increase in December, all, all steady there. But the fear from some of the economists is if the stimulus package overcooks the economy, then inflation is going to increase. Um, and that's going to be not a 2021 problem, but a 2022 so that's that's where I think the fear on on some of the interest rates projections. I think you're fine this year on interest rates on that, um, but it's a fear. Bank of America came out today um, and was quoted saying that the fear um, fear again on inflation hitting in 2022 would impact rates. So that's that's the rates. I'll stop there and have, have maybe have Jeff jump in. I was just going to say that I you know I think the same fundamentals are at play. Uh, in the multifamily world in that we've had 
really low rates through the pandemic. And um, as, as Wes mentioned, the 10 years up now, but, but lender spreads are still pretty, pretty hefty. I, I primarily uh, finance apartments through Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Um, but you're, you're still looking at, at rates in the low threes. Um, and, and so people are set and, and then you see a lot of apartments where you've got uh, uh, tenants that are struggling to pay their rent on time. And so you're seeing cash flows uh, drop in certain submarkets around the Bay Area. Uh, but but price expectations of sellers, as Helen mentioned earlier, really haven't changed. And so what we've seen is cap rates actually drop yeah. because they want the same price on a lower NOI, a lower cash flow on the property. And um, and if you can get you know rate a, a ten year fixed rate loan in the low threes, um, you know we're seeing what we're seeing is is that more buyers of properties over 50 units where you start getting institutional money. There's a ton of that money out there and they've got to get it out. And so we're seeing people buy at, at crazy prices, but, uh, but inventory is still really tight and rates are low and, and that's keeping the pressure on, on pricing. And I, and I also, one other point to, to follow up on what Wes said about inflation, I think, we're, we're geared up for a, a stretch run here of a lot of stimulus, a lot of, a lot of central uh, bank, you know, the Fed keeping rates low. And I think you're really going to have, um, uh, you're really going to see asset prices rise over the next five to seven years would be my guess. Um, and, and even outpacing probably uh, consumer uh, inflation. And I just saw somebody ask a question about debt service coverage ratios. Mm -hmm. uh, typically, we're seeing those on acquisition loans where there's fresh equity coming in at 1.25. And um, for cash out refinances, 1.3 1, 1 or a little higher uh, as kind of your max leverage points. Yeah, we do notice that some of the debt, debt service coverage ratio has increased um, across uh, uh, and for those who don't understand that, that's more for the commercial loan side. They need to make sure that the net operating income for the building can cover uh, at least 1.25 of their uh, annual debt services. And so, uh, I mean, it's interesting because you guys both talked about how, how low the rate is. And obviously, we also know that the rate is cannot stay this low forever. And uh, we've been trying to keep, keep it posted like regarding the mortgage rate projections by Freddie Mac and me. MBA um, and also NAR. And they all have basically the our 2Q is probably going to be the lowest and then it's going to start inching up uh, with 2022 1Q. They're expecting about 3.17% on average uh, of the four, of four organizations. Do you guys think that's probably where we're, we're heading towards as well? I think the unknown is, is still the inflation, how it impacts us in 22. So as I said, 21, Hey, we're going to enjoy low rates, and and even with that inflation, if you're still sub four, those those are still low rates for the resi side. So, yeah. um, same same with us too. I mean, shoot, I've been I've been talking about you know at, at various conferences uh, for the last eight years about rates going up, and and I, I you know I've been wrong the whole for eight years, so I, I hesitate to, to make any forward looking predictions because my track record is not great, but I said the uh, same thing since I, <laughs> I think 2014 I was like well we're supposed to be going into you know 5% next year and then I'm like it hasn't gotten there yet. Um, but I agree with you. I've been saying that as well. And uh, who would have thought that our rate would actually come down below 3% um, is pretty incredible. But this chart also shows exactly why our housing market is going crazy. Because if you really adjusted um, these monthly mortgage payment according to the inflation, then we are paying less than back in 2000 and 2006. Uh, but 2012, uh, because of the price being so low, then of course the price was pretty low. But at the same time, we have adjusted and looking at the interest rate, this is the reason why so many people are jumping into the housing market and buy homes right now. 
And uh, in terms of forbearance, of course, this is one of the biggest topic is uh, regarding the mortgage loans and forbearance. And it has been remaining at unchanged at 5.38%. And it says, but given the huge price gains recently, I don't think many homes will have to go to foreclosure. I think homes will just be sold and there will be cash left over for the seller, even in a distressed situation. So that's a bit of a silver lining in that we don't expect a massive sale of distressed properties. Sorry, this is actually by Lawrence Yoon from uh, National Association of Realtors. And here is another chart showing the mortgage loan forbearance. And uh, I know, Wes, you had some, some thought about that as well, but I thought this is really interesting is that it's showing 51.7% are paid in full and 33% have a workout repayment plan. And while 15.3% are still in trouble. And this is kind of like the data from the Mortgage Bankers Association. Is this what you're saying as well? Yeah, no, that's you, you made a really good point, Helen, and, and one that I was I was going to bring up is that so we have 560,000 customers that we service. So and we we understand kind of credit sensitive assets, but very different from the last crisis because people have equity. So our prepayment speeds when we're looking at prepayments, it's amazing that people are resolving their um, if they have an issue by selling their house. And taking that taking that equity, so I, I think that people thought that there was going to be inventory at the end when after the foreclosure moratorium, uh, there's going to be less inventory because people are going to sell their house. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that's the only thing you're going to see is, is a pop on that. So um, that's I, I think you made an excellent point on that. Out of the forbearances that we have, when we kind of follow what the NBA and Black Knight puts out, we still have. 14% of the people that are forbearance that continue to make their payments. Um, and I agree with you that of the ones that are going to be the, the problems that still are going to have problems after that, that's why it's kind of flattened out that curve of people coming in or and flattened out of people exiting. Um, it's kind of status quo right now. So I, I you know, I hope, hope, you know, we're, we're going to work, work hard to kind of help resolve the, uh, for these customers. Yeah, it's interesting. You mentioned Black Knight, and that's my next slide. I swear we didn't talk beforehand about these slides. I independently put these uh, these slides together. But yeah, from Black Knight uh, report, they're showing here is that um, for, out of the 4.9 million forbearances, um, actually 2.3 uh, 2.3 million had uh, been removed from this forbearance plans, and they are performing now. Um, although there are 4% that is uh, an active loss mitigation and uh, there's still another 2% is they're still delinquent, but 12% have been paid off. And um, there are active forbearance with the original terms that are 5% and then there are extended 30% of them extend. I mean, it, it is still significant um, that they are still an active forbearance, but I think it's just a little bit more comforting to see that we have 47% actually are performing now. Hmm. That's good. Yeah, okay. and I would say too on the um, on the multifamily side, you know, Feeney and Freddie have offered um, forbearance to um, uh, to owners of multifamily properties that have their loans on it, and typically it's a 120 day or up to 120 day uh, forbearance period, and then uh, then you've got 12 months after that to add those payments back on top, and and uh, when, when this whole thing rolled out, I mean, we were, as a company, we service over $100 billion in, in uh, multifamily loans. And we were scrambling about how many people are, are going to be banging down our doors to not make their payments. Yeah. And it turned out to be very, very few. I mean, I think the initial CARES Act that, you know, provided the enhanced unemployment benefits and some of the direct payments, we really didn't see rent rolls decline um, in the early days of the pandemic. Where we've seen rent rolls deteriorate has been over the last several months because the stimulus ran out and they've been negotiating, you know, various packages. And the one just passed has 25 billion in rental relief that's getting out to the states. Obviously in typical government fashion, it's taking a lot longer than what they said it would to get in the hands of landlords. But but most properties, uh, we're not seeing distressed sales in multifamily, except in very few cases. 
Now, it's a topic for a whole nother webinar, but if you got into, um, you know, strip centers and, and hospitality, there's, there's real trouble uh, there and, and, and probably more trouble to come. But as far as residential real estate goes, it's not been too big of a problem. Absolutely, I agree with you. Um, actually, I do have some slides about those other asset types as well and at the end, uh, but this is another uh, data to show that, you know, right now, as of December 31st, we have total non-current, about 3.4 million um, uh, uh, loans that are non-current. Uh, now, I'm going to say, let's not look at the foreclosure starts. Obviously, we have forbearance right now, you know, so these are not that numbers. And, uh, but if you look at compared to 2009 to 2014, you know, total non current, we have 3.4, but over here we are at 6.7 and 2014, we have 4.3. If you look at a number that way, just like, okay, we're not really as bad as in the previous recession. It's really not even close to this 7.89 million in total non current. Um, is this how you guys, I'm, I even myself, I feel like, I, I mean, I'm looking at this data, it just doesn't show me that there is going to be a wave of huge foreclosure that is out of the ordinary compared to any other years. Yeah, the, the credit quality for compared to the 08 and 09 is like far superior. Mm -hmm. Then you have equity. Um, and then like the underwriting guidelines back then with stated income for, for resi, um, owner occupancy fraud, that, that's non-existent. Um, yeah. So you, you actually have good credit quality with people experiencing problems that uh, forbearance is helping out with. Yeah, uh, and I remember those days. I actually started my real estate career in 2005. And th at that time, I was a mortgage loan broker. And uh, I remember I was like, wow, stated income, stated assets. You really you just need to say, tell people, tell the underwriter, this is how much I make. I don't need to prove anything. And we used to have a joke back then saying, like, as long as you can breathe, you can get a loan. Well, to, to that point, uh, one of my top clients is um, Shea Properties and Shea Homes, obviously. So they, they are both in the apartment business and, and in the single family business. And, and I never forget them telling me a story back then that they'd have somebody go in uh, to rent an apartment and wouldn't qualify. And they'd go across the street to the sales center and end up walking out with a new home. Oh. You know, so that tells you how much things were on their head. Totally. Yeah, it is definitely very different back then. And um, I still can keep hearing, uh, you know, I watch YouTube videos all the time. I listen to it when I'm doing dishes. So I want to know what other people are talking about. And my feed is just filled with housing market crash and foreclosure waves. I cannot help to, that's why I start doing all this research because I've gone through the 2008 recession at that time. I, re I understood why we had this massive foreclosure crisis. A lot of people literally, they just gave up because it's a, this is investment decision. I didn't put any money down. Why should, what, what's wrong with that? I'll just let it go, right? The time you can get a loan with no down payment. So in the sense that you're not really losing much. Uh, but right now it's very different because most, at least in the Bay Area here, most of the homes um, have at least 20% down uh, or equity in it. So I just don't see how people would just give up their home that easily. And here is like a little bit of a summary. Basically it says like uh, the change in delinquency rate had dropped th uh, dropped by 3.9%. Foreclosure start again, because of the, um, uh, uh, you know, the, the forbearance, I'm sorry, for the moratorium. And so that's why there's no foreclosure starts. And, but the prepayment activity actually gone up by 12%. One of the reason is also because uh, the rate had gone down. So a lot of people are refinancing and that's considered part of prepayment activity. And then here, you know, if you want to know where California is, is ranked um, uh, compared to anywhere else, we constantly get this question all the time from our clients. And so I would show them, actually, I did this chart um, a few months ago as well. As you see, California, we have just 4.6% delinquency. Uh, foreclosure percentage is 0.1. Non-current is 4.7%. We are not at the top 10 market uh, where uh, Mississippi, Louisiana, Hawaii, they are getting a much bigger hit in terms of these delinquency. 
All right, and then commercial real estate market, uh, just like what Jeff, you were saying that look at the vacancy rates uh, for hotel is that 34, uh, uh, after 34% in 2019 and 2020 is uh, about 37. And the forecast for the 2021 is 35%. And retail uh, has gone to 11, I mean, is expecting to be about 11% this year. Multifamily, we're staying pretty consistent as well as industrial. So out of the commercial markets, industrial and multifamily probably doing relatively good. And office, um, I'm, I'm a little surprised with this number, which is through N NAR, that um, I do see a lot of vacancy in offices. I mean, they have leases, don't get me wrong, they have leases. But I'm saying there are people who are not continuing their lease anymore. They, they completely moved out. So, um, I mean, do you guys have any, you know, do you see any uh, um, uh, situation on the offices? I think that office number might be a little misleading because I don't know that it takes into account, um, you know, space that's coming on the market uh, as sublease space. So... Yeah. You might have a building that's, you know, 90% occupied in terms of signed leases, but especially in kind of the urban cores, San Francisco, mm -hmm. I mean, there is a ton of empty sublease uh, space available. And I'm not sure that's getting captured in these numbers. And, you know, that's always an early trouble sign in that sector because either people are going to walk from those leases if they can't rent them or you know, the, the landlord's gonna have to get involved if the, if the gap between the, the current pay lease and what the sublease market will yield is too big of a gap. It, 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 I, I, don't, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm a little skeptical on that projection. I, I mean, just what, two days ago, Salesforce Tower now, I mean, they just said that all of their employees can be working from home permanently. Uh, I'm just like, oh my gosh, that's a huge tower right there. And what is the occupancy? What are they going to do with the whole, you know, all their office spaces? So, um, yeah, I think we definitely have to see what's going to happen. Although I do believe that people will still have to go back to office, maybe instead of five days a week, maybe down to two or three days a week instead, um, no matter what, especially uh, I think if your profession involves some kind of innovation, there's a lot of collaborative work that you just can't really do it from the computer only. So, um, so yeah, I, I see some of the some of the profession can definitely go into completely remote, but at the same time, a lot of jobs in the Bay Area probably will still require you to go into the office a couple times a week at least. Oh, there's no question. And I, look, I, you, you see what's interesting is what that impact has had on housing because uh, you know, I live in the East Bay out in Danville and, uh, and the markets, the residential market's been red hot out here. And what it is, is it's people selling their small house in Palo Alto or in, you know, Santa Clara or wherever they are. And now that they're working remote and they know that eventually they might only have to commute over there a couple of days a week. So they're, they're a lot of the people I've met that have bought houses in my town in the last six months have come over from the city or the peninsula. And, uh, and it'll be interesting to see what impact that has on you know, if you only need to go in two days a week, do you need as much office space as you did before? It'll, it'll be interesting to see what the trends coming out of this are. But I think you're right. This We're not going to a remote world out of this. I mean, mm -hmm. we're just not. But I'll, I'll speak for Carrington and the villa companies that, so we have 3,500 employees. We're, we're shocked at the efficiency that and productivity of that. So we're out of those, we're, probably only going to bring back 35 to 40 key, uh, 35% of them. Um, and as long as license activities can remain, which the NBA and other groups are, are kind of fighting for, uh, when some of those lease terms come up in 22, 23, um, you know, we'll redo our footprint. Yeah. So. 
I think it's more like the office space, uh, again, the usage is going to be like, well, let's say a lot of real estate company, for example, they would have a 5,000 square feet office space, but then they realize that maybe most of the time it's less than 50% of the agents will go into the office because you tend to be able to just work from home. And for me, as an exam example, is that I, I have three children I wanted to be able to work from home instead of going to the office so I can do things more efficiently. So yeah, I think this is going to be very interesting how it's going to change, but at the same time, not completely eliminating this office space. It's just that people are going to really shrink down their footprint um, in the office space. And Pam actually asked this question, do you foresee these office spaces potentially being converted into housing options? Um, want to hear from you guys first before I make my own comment as well. I'll let Jeff tackle it. Well, I, I don't know, you know, office, potentially, office is a little tricky. Now, hotels, we've definitely seen that trend accelerate, uh, converting, you know, certain hospitality uh, properties into, um, you know, into, into multifamily or um, doing a partial conversion on some of them. So I think you're gonna more likely see that in, in, the, in the hotel and hospitality sector than you will in the office. And actually, you know, there's um, suburb, like two or three story suburban office was always a little bit of the redheaded stepchild in the office world. And, and we've seen that come back now. I mean, we've seen, you know, guess what? If you're, you know, maybe not, maybe Google's not the right word, but say you're a tech company on the peninsula or in this city with really expensive space. And now you're requiring your employees to only come in two days a week. Well, we're hearing anecdotally now that some of those companies are now renting, you know, 3000 square feet in, in a place like Walnut Creek or, you know, maybe Santa Rosa up in the North Bay or, or you know, and having like little pods where, where people can still come together, um, but they don't have to go to the mothership every day. So um, who knows if that'll keep going or what that trend ultimately looks like, but that's been interesting to see. I absolutely agree with you. I, I think also it's a little bit difficult for office, not only like how it's structured in there, there's no bathroom and um, very limited kitchen area, but it's a zoning also for these office offices. So uh, the hotel is probably more of a likely target to uh, repurpose the building if right. it's really suffering. Um, and here is like for multifamily, we do this tracker every month. And in February, usually the first six days, uh, we see it ranges about 79, 80% around there on the co collections. And uh, we always look at full months because a lot of tenants actually pay later uh, after the six. And then we are at about 93.2% for January. Uh, it is lower compared to August. Um, and kind of relatively lowest uh, if you compare the past few months but at the same time it is also we are we're talking about 93.2 percent um so uh some of the some of the sell that's their point to us it's like look we are still collecting rents and then the buyers go back well i don't know how long that's gonna last what if after i buy it your tenant is not gonna pay rent and then there's an eviction moratorium so that's why there is this gap between sellers and buyers that they they, they cannot come into agreement. Um, uh, is that what you're seeing too, Jeff, when you do multifamily loans? Yeah, no, for sure. Uh, it, it, it puts pressure on buying and then also financing uh, these properties when, you know, one of the things that, that we look closely at as a lender, you know, we get an operating statement in and everything looks pretty rosy. And then if you dig deeper, uh, most owners accrue the unpaid rents over time and they don't book it as bad debt until that tenant moves out or, you know, it reaches a certain point where you just know you're not going to get paid. So, you know, we're lenders of all stripes are really looking under the hood um, of these operating statements and rent rolls to say, you know, what do we really have here in terms of cash coming in the door? Um, and, and we see a pretty wide variety of, 
of answers to that. I mean, that most of the most of the difference we see. I mean, it's kind of a like a Charles Dickens. It's a tale of two two cities. Uh, we're seeing suburban larger unit um, properties collect most all of their rent rolls, and we're seeing uh, higher rent, smaller unit urban deals are the ones where when we look under the hood, there's a lot more people not making the rent payments. Um, and also, I think there's a more organized effort in certain cities like San Francisco of tenant rights people really getting the word out, hey, you don't have to pay your rent. They can't kick you out. Uh, you only, you know, there, there's there's groups out there really facilitating and making it easy for people to not make their rent payments. Uh, whereas in more suburban markets, you just don't have that dynamic, so. Yeah, I think it is also important um, to, to kind of emphasize that obviously most of the tenants, they are great people, they're honest people, they do want to pay their rent if they are able to. And then there are some very small percentage of the tenants, same thing for landlords, a small percentage of them, they just out there try to take advantage of you, right? So, um, I mean, all these tenants rights group, I think they, are, they have a good intention to help the tenants, but at the same time, somehow this has been portraying the landlords to be the bad people, the greedy ones, and they are the one who, who is very well off. And then now we're starting to see more and more news about like these mom and pops landlords that are really struggling as well. They lost their job and this is their only income. Not only they don't get the income, they now have to pay for all these maintenance costs for the building. So the legislators really, when they are proposing some of these policies, I just really, really hope that to see them to propose something more fair for both sides. <laughs> Helen, you've you've lived in California long enough to know that the likelihood of that is very very slim. <laughs> Unfortunately, you're right though, and and uh, you know, they, they, fortunately, the voters um, saw through the attempt to a pass a split tax roll on commercial property and b also defeated uh, the. Prop 21, which would have just turned rent control on its head throughout the state. So we averted two real disastrous events right there, but certainly not out of the woods. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, here is like some of the, uh, this is a chart also showing what are the missed payments by renters and then how many more uh, uh, the, the landlords are missing the payments as well. So as you see that actually there are probably obviously more renters that are not paying and then a less on the 5.7% uh, for the for the landlords that are not making the mortgage payments. Uh, but student loans borrowers, they are definitely hurting right now of 43.2% that they are not paying their payments. So that's all of my report for you guys. And let me stop share right now. I want to see if you have any other feedback about the mortgage projections, like I mean, besides the rate is going to go up, how is it going to really affect our housing market? Well, that's all you take that one. <laughs> yeah. So one more time, Helen. It's like with the mortgage rate that we know is going to come up and we saw that how it had really you know helped our housing market so as this mortgage rate is going to start inching up luckily it's not going to be like drastically just go uh, well, hopefully it's not going to increase by one percent do you see that that's going to like really detrimentally affecting the housing market in the bay area no i you know i don't i don't think so because i just um, attended a kind of talk with uh, mark Fleming, who's the chief economist for first american and his whole point was that if, okay, so maybe inflation increases the rate, he still thinks it's gonna be a sub four rate, right? So if, even it's high threes, that's still a good rate. Um, and the, the inventory is still controlled on that. So, you know, with the lack of in inventory, that's it's still gonna be, you know, people competing for those homes. Um, the one thing that the NBA chief economist came out today that they're seeing in some of their surveys is that with a, uh, the vaccine rollout, they, they anticipate listings to go up. So I think that's good for, for the whole economy because I mean, appreciation is going rapid in all your examples you gave, right? So if there's more inventory out there, that might be, 
better for kind of a long-term yes. view of how the economy is going. You're still going to have appreciation, right? It, it just might not be as crazy as it is now. I absolutely agree with you. I mean, right now, besides the mortgage rate that's being low, we also have inventory that's really low. And that's why we have this crazy number of offers for properties right now. And there are a lot of movements in California and just in the Bay Area alone, just like what Jeff, you also mentioned earlier, I think um, that a lot of people from Palo Alto might be moving to Danville, um, to East Bay. And we see that in person every single week. We talk to buyers, new buyers who are talking about moving, you know, it's like, it's like okay, I, maybe I should move to East Bay or maybe I should move more South. I don't mind to drive a little bit further now, but I need a bigger yard. That's like constantly the same conversation over and over again, how people are changing the way they live and they're willing to sacrifice um, the distance because they know that they don't have to go to work as often anymore. Um, but but uh, we are right now at what, like one point, I think 1.5 month of inventory, uh, pretty much whatever comes out, it sells. But we really need to wait until like six months of inventory. That's considered more of a balanced market. And we still can continue to see the appreciation. It's just not going to be double digits like what we're seeing now. Maybe it will be single digits, uh, which is a little bit more healthier for everybody. But I honestly don't think, I, I agree, I don't think that one, I don't think that it's going to crash. But I do think that the appreciation is going to be much slower in the future. Um, Whitney actually has a question. Um, how is the lender lending to multifamily deals if no one knows how certain the tenants will pay for the rent and or if there is some vacant vacancy? Well, it's a great question. I mean, we're that's why we're we're digging in uh, into those fact patterns as closely as we can. I mean, it, you're. All you can do, I think at least there's a little more comfort now in, no, in, in seeing the track record since the pandemic started. It was really challenging back in April and May because we just didn't know who was going to pay and who was not going to pay. So we have a much better idea of that now, assuming that we're truly at near the end of this than the beginning, right, coming out the other end. Um, and... You know, while I think I uh, agree with Wes that, you know, I don't think we need $2 trillion on top of the $3.3 trillion we've already pumped into the economy. And that doesn't even count what the Fed has been doing behind the scenes. But, but, that there, but some of that is targeted towards um, the people that need the help to pay their rent. So that that hopefully will get us over the hump until we're out the other side. But one of the other things is a lot of lenders, um, including Fannie and Freddie on the apartment side, we're escrowing, depending on the leverage point, anywhere from six to 12 months of amortizing debt service payments at closing. Yeah. So we've got a bucket of money that, you know, the borrower can draw on to make payments if something really drastic was, was going to happen at the property. Now, I have not had a client have to dip into that yet. That there's still the gap between those that are paying and not paying. That that sliver has been small enough that they can they can manage that through um, through just regular cash flow and operations. So, fingers crossed that we can get through the last number of months of this without further any you know any greater problems. You made a good point is actually um, a lot of our clients who are looking for multifamily right now. And that is one of the biggest obstacles. Like, oh my gosh, we have to put away 12 months worth of yes. you know, mortgage payments. And it's not like, oh, you just need to show in the bank. You actually have to put it away in a yes. with the lender. So that is a part that is like the most difficult. So now I'm curious, what about the multifamily market uh, with what we just discussed with the forbearance foreclosures? Um, moratorium. I mean, what? How are you seeing the multifamily markets? You know, post COVID. I think we're going to come out of it the other side, just you know, fine for the most part. I, I think I'd be most worried if I owned a uh, a deal in you know L.A. in downtown San Francisco that um, is newer, not rent controlled, mm -hmm. and um, and relied on top of the market rents in order to make the investment pencil. 
because we don't know how long it's going to take, you know, people to move back right into these downtown cores and and pay top dollar for smaller units. Um, so those are the worry spots. Uh, but outside of that, I, I think fundamentally the multifamily markets held up um, amazingly well, and it's been very resilient. I mean, if you go back to the slides you have, the two the two asset classes that continue to draw the most capital on the debt and equity side are multifamily and industrial. And, yeah. you know, the amount of Amazon trucks you see out in your neighborhoods. And I mean, it, it just, it makes sense. It really yeah. does. Yeah. And it's like, we, we talked a little bit just a few minutes before the, the webinar started. It's like the suburban and the urban area. That's the main difference right now that we are seeing. And um, it's funny, you mentioned the San Francisco, the top rents that people are looking for, because uh, the news just came out a couple of days ago as well, talking about the below market rate rent in San Francisco is, is higher than the market rent, the market rate rents. So people were just like moving out of the below market rate properties, the units, and then moving into these market rate yes. units. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, no, that it, it, it's, it's ironic, but true. And, you know, we're seeing effective rents in San Francisco are back down to 2016 levels now. Mm -hmm. So literally in, you know, nine months, what have you, um, they've lost three and a half, four years of rent growth. Yeah. Uh, and how long will that take to get, get back and occupancies? So those are the those are going to be the trouble spots that linger, I think, for a while after this. Yeah, I think this is also one of the reasons why when we advise our clients, it's kind of like, let's not be so tight with your cash flow. Let's have some room. Um, but I, I, I see it. I mean, some some investors, they do want to just go into a market where it's more stable and also um, they, they're banking up the appreciation more, which San Francisco was doing really well with appreciation. But at the same time, it is a little risky in the sense that something like this happened. The, the rent dropped 27% right now. Uh, which is quite scary for some of the landlords if they have maxed max out on their leverage. Exactly. And Paul asks, as lenders get through their backlogs of applications, will interest rates begin to go down further? If so, when will this happen? Okay, that's a good question. So the, most of the major lenders and us included, it's the, um, the talent pool of like underwriters and everything else is we're hiring from coast to coast. So it's not, we're not tied anymore you can't be um so i think um from that and training and you know tra cross training it's going to hit the thing it's going to hit a mark probably in the summertime where <clears throat> that that you could it, that um the productivity and the underwriting will catch up with the volume at the same time i think the, the 10 years is going to raise and they're going to equal everything out. So when they could drop, they'll drop their margin, <clears throat> but it's it won't um, won't be impacted because I think there's going to be a rising tenure. So uh, if you get what I'm saying, so we'll, lenders will decrease their margin, but the tenure will rise and it should be flat. And that's what the MBA kind of said, right? When they, when you actually, put up the it's the awesome five years rate is more expensive than the thirty years. Have you seen that? Yeah, I watched the two, the two year and the 10 year. So I, I'm kind of focused on that. I see, I see. Yeah, it's quite interesting how this uh, whole interest rates, I, I'm just looking at if anyone can do the 30 years, I'm like, just do the 30 years right now. I don't right. know if you can ever get that rate again. No, no. Uh, we, we actually have a VA loan and we just got a 2.25% 30 years and we jumped right on. I was like, my gosh, there's no way we can ever get anything close to that. When I had 3.25, I thought I was, I was like, that's it. This is more for my next 30 years. <laughs> good, good timing. Yes. <laughs> on that. Um, and can you comment on SBA loans and their interest rates for commercial refinancing? Um, I don't know if you guys have any experience in the SBA loans. You know, SBA is it's a whole different animal. It's a whole separate world. And um, I, would, uh, I wouldn't even begin to guess uh, what's happening in that world right now. I, mm -hmm. I can talk to um, 
uh, FHA loans in the multifamily world. And those are, I mean, those are just priced incredibly uh, well right now. I mean, you on a refinance, you can get a 35 year loan term, 35 years of amortization, and you're right around 3% on that. Wow. Yeah. And it's got only 10 years of call protection. So the prepayment penalty steps down every year. So your last 25 years, you can pay it off at par. And uh, now you've got a partner in the federal government in your property for forever. Uh, and there's headaches with that. And it's, the loan's expensive and time consuming to do. And as you can imagine, the, the paperwork is incredibly onerous. But for those borrowers that don't mind doing that and really want, you know, we see folks that, you know, they, they, They've run, owned the property forever, but um, they're getting older and their kids don't, you know, that, they're not in the business of owning apartments. Well, this is a great loan because, the, you know, when something happens, the kids aren't stuck trying to figure out how to refinance the property or what to do with the loan and all that. So um, it's, it's, they're still really, really inexpensive. Is the FHA for the multifamily, what is the minimum um, down payment requirement or the DSCR requirement? Uh, you can go, uh, so on a cash out refinance, it's 80% LTV. On a, if you're buying a property, it's, uh, I think it's 83.3%. Uh, and then the debt coverage is low. It's like a 1.17. 1. Debt 1. coverage. Wow. That's yeah, and based on a 35-year amortization instead of a 30-year. Wow. So they're high in proceeds, uh, great on rate, great on term, and a, a pain in the rear end on everything else. But, yeah. <laughs> <that's>, <laughs> you know, as, as a matter of fact, a lot of people don't really know about these all these loan options out there. Um, so you see right now, what, what is the most popular loan products for multifamily? Well, it, it really depends on the business plan for the asset. Um, you know, if, if you're just going to kind of operate it and, and rents are at or near market and you're just going to plug along. I mean, we, we do a ton of the 7, 10, 12 year fixed rate Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac loans. They're non-recourse. Mm -hmm. the pricing's great. Uh, you know, we're also, there's a ton of capital that's come in via these debt funds. And so they're putting capital out on, at, with shorter terms, maybe, you know, two to five years. Uh, it's typically floating rate, um, you know, call it LIBOR plus three to 4%, depending on how aggressive uh, the capital stack is. But so if you're, if you're buying a property that maybe is only 80% occupied, you need to renovate the units, you know, that's a good play because um, they look less at in-place cash flow than they do the business plan. Yeah. And then, then you've got the banks doing what the banks do. Um, a lot of the smaller loan stuff is, gets done by the, the commercial banks. And, and then finally, I would say the life insurance companies, they're another big component, but they typically want to see loan amounts 10 or 20 million and higher um, and low, lower leverage. But if you fit in that bucket, you know, they'll have some of the best rates. Yeah. Great. I mean, it just sounds like there are still a lot of options out there and investors are really not afraid to lend out the money for these uh, multifamily sector. They do want a little bit more protection, but it's not really as hard as some people might think because of the whole eviction moratorium and um, mortgage moratorium, uh, foreclosure mortgage for, um, moratorium. Um, and Wes, what about uh, for the residential loan? I know, you know, during COVID, the jumbo loan, especially a lot of lenders have eliminated the 10% down payment program. Um, so I, there's just like a handful of lenders are doing that. Do you see a major change in any of these loan programs? No, I, I think that uh, from the like the risk pro profile, I mean, the when jumbos kind of went away, it, I think it hurt everything. Um, but um, you know, they've came back. I don't think there's going to be a wide expansion in that. The, now, the Biden team coming in, and I know people, it's advising the Biden team. I think you're going to see some changes on, especially with FHA loans. You know, they're going to um, probably reduce the MIP. 
uh, 25 basis points. So that's going to be a lower rate. It's not really good for the Bay Area market as much more as Central Valley on that. But they're looking at an alternative credit um, and some other things, which are going to take another year or so. But they want to expand uh, credit. So there's going to be a, a, a big push to expand credit and an opportunity for more people. Mm -hmm. It's just going to take longer to figure what those are. You know, uh, you actually brought up a good point also uh, regarding the Bay Area housing, where the FHA program is actually one of the higher number of, um, uh, I guess, I delinquent mortgages out there. Right. Um, it's FHA and VA loans, which is actually, those two are not the major players in the Bay Area in terms of like Santa Clara County, Alameda County, or um, San Mateo counties. But the Central Valley probably more have more of the um, the FHA loans or VA loans being used right now. So that's also another reason why we don't think that um, the Bay Area will have this wave of foreclosure because we really started to have clients asking us, "How can I find foreclose foreclosures in the Bay Area?" I'm like, nearly none. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, you know, today it's been so fun talking to you both and uh, really thank you for all your insights and I love it because I think this is one of the biggest question for everybody is like, okay, what is going to happen with foreclosures and forbearance plans, whether our Bay Area housing market is going to crash or not. I'm not here to tell everybody that you know, there's no housing market crash in the entire country, but we are really just focusing on the Bay Area here, uh, where we use statistics and also facts to show everybody uh, why we think that there's not going to be a crash. Why, if you're thinking thinking about buying a home for yourself, this is the time to lock in that low interest rates. And there's nothing better than you know finding a permanent home for your family just to have a peace of mind. And as, as an investors for multifamily, there are still loan programs out there. Um, I know it's, it's a little scary. I had held off some of my investors, like just wait, just hold off on it. Um, I actually thought that there was gonna be a wave of foreclosures on the multifamily side myself as well. But now talking to you, Jeff, and I realized like maybe there, you know, is not going to happen. Um, so I'm really glad that you <laughs> you clarified that for me. And then maybe we need to step on the step on the gas pedal now. It was like, okay, we got to go find something now. Um, you know, I don't. I don't think. I don't think you're going to see asset uh, hard assets like uh, single family homes or multifamily. Um, I just, I don't see prices coming down in the near to mid term. Uh, so, you know, don't be afraid to jump in, especially if your plan, game plan is to be a long-term owner. Uh, you know, don't, don't be afraid to take the plunge. Absolutely agree. Long-term play is always important. Just don't gamble on your investment. Um, yep. And do you guys mind to share your contact information? If somebody has a question regarding multifamily loan or residential loan, um, can you share your contact information here? Uh, sure. Yeah. So my, um, my email is Wes, W-S dot Isley, I-S-E-L-E-Y at Carrington, C-A-R-R-I-N-G-T-O-N, and then M-S, for mortgageservicing.com. Great, and Jeff? And you know what, I'm just typing mine into <laughs> uh, into the chat right now, so. Perfect. There's my. Oh, perfect. My... Good. Jay Burns and walkerdunlove.com. Well, thank you so much, both of you, for being on here, and I've learned a ton. And uh, for those at home um, or in your office watching this, uh, we will be editing this video and then put it on uh, on YouTube. So I hope that you guys will come back next month for our next topic. If you have any suggestions, please feel free to let me know. Until next month, I hope you guys will stay well. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much for watching and don't forget to subscribe to our channel and also come back often to check out our new videos and also every second Wednesday of the month from 4 to 5 p.m. Pacific time, we will be doing our Bay Area Housing Market Town Hall and bring to you a lot of great speakers and to share a lot of real estate information and I look forward to see you back. Bye.